Psalm 16, a mictum of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones who, in whom is all my delight. The sore of those who run after another God shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is God's word. It was around five years ago um, to around this time of year that my life came to a crashing halt. Uh, after an unsustainable season of uh, long days on the road as a delivery truck driver, uh, trying to finish my seminary degree, working uh, close to full time as an intern, which probably wasn't the wisest decision at a church, though I was, and all this while being a few months into marriage. I was diagno diagnosed with what uh, doctors have called uh, as a late-onset type 1 diabetes. I still remember the crushing news as I sat in the, uh, in the hospital. The news came so vividly to me as I sat there trying to piece my life together as deep fear and anxiety crept and kind of strangled, took a stranglehold over my heart. I've never felt my life so out of control than in those moments in I would say probably for the first time in my life, I began to pray with the kind of angst that said, Lord, why? Why is this happening to me? I've lived 30 years of my life almost, never broken a bone, never experienced any kind of uh, serious uh, ailments in health. Lord, why? Maybe you've had a similar experience in your life where you've been interrupted in such a way where the security that you so held dear to or the rug was pulled out from underneath you where that security didn't seem very secure anymore. A job loss, a marriage failure, the loss of a child or a loved one, an ailing body, a failed business venture, the, the list could go on and on. I'm sure if we were to listen to each other this evening. And the current affairs of our world recently, if anything, reveal to us how quickly the foundations of our security and comfort can be turned upside down in a moment, hey? Where, where do you turn in these moments? Where do I turn in these moments? What is it about our faith in God that is going to steady us and bring us the kind of comfort that we so desperately need? I believe tonight Psalm 16 has much to say about that. That we need to hide in God. If we're going to find any true and lasting comfort in this life, we must hide ourselves in God. Or as David puts it so clearly in verse 1, to take refuge in life and death in the Lord. To take refuge in Him. And so over this next bit, over these next few moments, I want to share a few, uh, a few words of what I believe this passage is saying of what a hidden life in God looks like. What does it mean to have a hidden life in God? Firstly, to hide in God means we trust His provision for us. We trust His provision in our lives. If we were to take a brief survey of one's life in the Old Testament who faced grief and loss and betrayal and insecurity, David, the presumed author of this psalm, would, would certainly fit the bill. And yet, at the same time, it was no secret for David that he was able to trust in the provision of God, not because he knew God merely in the abstract or merely as this uh, ideology, but that he knew God personally. 
Verse 2, he says, I say to my Lord, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Did you hear that? I say to my Lord. This covenantal language that David is using reveals this intimate trust in God. He confesses Israel's God as his own. It was this understanding of having a personal relationship with God that led him to know in the deepest sense that nothing else in this world could satisfy him. That nothing could bring true and lasting joy into his heart. That no good that he could experience, whether through the gifts that God had given him or through his own posture and righteousness before God, could be given but by God alone. I've been reading through uh, the confessions of uh, Augustine recently. And right at the introduction, as many of you know, he's quoted by saying that our hearts are restless until they find our rest in God. David's pointing us here by humbly acknowledging that everything in this life, everything flows from the hand of his creator. In fact, it's interesting as as we read on that his understanding of God's provision and goodness also led him to delight in God's people. Where do we see this? Well, in verse 3, he says, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. Sure, his faith was personal. But it wasn't just private. His delight in the Lord also allowed him to have a delight in God's people. I think there's much we could say about this. But when God captivates our lives and becomes our delight, our our love towards those around us, especially God's people, is magnified. Now, everything that he seems to be saying there about God being his provision, of God being his only good, Well, verse 4, he seems to contrast this with those who are in pursuit of other gods. And he says, he said, the sores of those who run after another god shall multiply. I mean, there's much that we could say tonight. We could be here for such a long time if we were to unpack a framework of idolatry in the Bible, and what it meant in the Old Testament to chase after other gods. But in brief, I want to say this. Anything that we ascribe ultimate value, significance, and meaning to our lives in the place of God becomes an idol and has mastery over our lives. Whether wealth, whether power, beauty, a relationship, politics, or material possessions, when we chase after these things to provide for our sense of identity and meaning in life, we're learning that we will have Uh, that trouble will be on our doorstep, that sorrow will be multiplied, that it will not deliver all that it has promised. And I think many here would probably say, I've experienced that. The simple fact that our securities at any moment can be stripped from us reveals this to us. Our situations and pains in this life, and, and as last week we talked about, that we need to lament. We need to go to God in our pain and our sorrow. But oftentimes the sorrow in our lives as pointed in this passage is revealed when idols of our heart are exposed. When our comforts are challenged, when our insecurities are brought before us, when the things that we held so dear to becomes exposed. We recognize it, we bring it to the Lord and say, God, recalibrate our hearts, restore our hearts unto you, forgive me. And then we rejoice in him. David is saying, I don't even want this on my lips. I don't want to run after other idols. Lord, preserve me from this. Of course, we will experience great loss in this life, but we need to echo David's words that God is our Lord, that he is our cup and our portion, that our lines have fallen in pleasant places, and that we have a beautiful inheritance in God. Our losses, the things that we experience in this life that hurt They will be painful. There will be seasons where we live in the night, but it will not cripple us if we can delight in God. Let us run from other gods and run to the one who delights in his people and gives his people provision. We hide in God by depending and trusting upon the provision he gives to us. But secondly, to hide in God means that we trust in his presence that is with us. Where do we see this? I specifically want to look at verses 7 and 8. David confesses that he blesses God because he counsels him. This is not foreign language in the Psalms, that God's presence is 
to counsel God's people, Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Psalm 73 says this, With your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Psalm 48 says, For such is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us unto death. And one more, Psalm 119 verse 24 talks about how the testimonies of God are our counselors. And here we see David, he's rejoicing in the fact that God has been his counselor, his guide, his supreme wisdom in this life. I'm not sure where David was when he wrote this psalm. Maybe he was disillusioned, maybe on the run from Saul. It seems many points of his life for the better half of a decade, you would look and think, really? In this haphazard way of life, really, God, you're, you're leading David? It sure doesn't seem like it. It sure doesn't feel like it at times. How about us? How quickly does God's voice and his word grow faint in our lives and we turn to so many other things for counsel? Things that we believe will deliver what they're promising. And here, we can echo David's words. We can see his encouragement that he blesses the Lord, that God is the one who brings true counsel to his life. Are we hearing him? Are we, are we heeding his counsel? Are we pouring over God's word until God speaks to us? I know this can be difficult at times in our lives where we feel that God is aloof and arctic cold. He's not saying anything to me. I feel like opening the Bible is just another duty in my life. And I want to reorient, reorientate us tonight as David's saying that you are blessed. You are blessed when you take heed to God's counsel. Oh, that we would cherish God's word so that even as David said, in the night, how, in the night hour his heart instructed him. I'm not exactly sure what he's getting at there, but I think that one of the things that we could probably take from that is that God's word was so deep in his heart that when he was in the seasons of longing and lament and sorrow, that God's word was still alive to him. It was upon his mind, it was upon his heart that it was instructing him in this time. May we be a people that through the proclaiming of God's word, through the fellowship of God's people speaking God's word to one another, to our own time of pouring over God's word in prayer, may we be a people that look to God in his presence that gives counsel. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, O Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare at the rules of your mouth. In the ways of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Powerful language from Psalm 119. May we be a people that even as it says here that we would store up God's word in our hearts, that greater than any riches in this world, that we would delight in the testimonies of God. This is how we are counseled by God's presence. So we pray tonight, Lord, make your ways known to me. Teach me your paths. Lead me in truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. I wait all day long for you. So we see that a life hidden in God and depending upon the presence of God, is, is, is trusting that he is the one who is a mighty counselor in our lives. But as David goes on here, he also says, he begins to speak about how God's presence in asserting that the Lord is set before him and that God is at his right hand. Well, there's, there's so much that you can see throughout the Bible of what the significance means, the significance of being at one's right hand. Christ sitting at the right hand of God. In Psalm 110, there's so much to be said of how that, that's the place in which where God rules from. It's a place of honor. It's a place of power. And David is saying here that I will not be shaken because the Lord is set before my right hand. The great promise of the gospel is that we have one who advocates for us. He's given his spirit with us as his very presence. That when these times come where they feel that they're collapsing in our lives, we can look to God and say, he's one at our right hand. 
that he's one who is all-powerful, that God is one who can advocate as a good judge beside me, that when all hell is breaking loose in my life, that we will not be shaken. I was thinking of a song this week. Um, for the many years that I worked uh, at a camp, and we would sing this song, and to be honest with you, you just sing songs at times, and you don't really meditate or think about the words. And I, I, I penned down these words because this week was one of the first times I actually was singing and thinking about it and actually meditating upon what it actually meant. And it said this. You've probably heard this song. Although I did grow up in a Pentecostal church, and so maybe you didn't hear this song. <laughs> Those who love the Lord are satisfied. Those who trust in Him are justified. I will serve my God, serve my God all my days. When the nations crumble, the word of the Lord will stand. Kings may rise and fall. His love will endure. Though the strong may stumble, the joy of the Lord is my strength. To my soul, I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. To hide in God is to depend upon the presence of God, knowing that He is our advocate, the one at our right hand, as David is saying here, that without a shadow of a doubt, His presence is with you if you are His child tonight. What greater gift could there be than that God's Spirit, even as Jesus promised His disciples, that He would be with us even to the end of the age. We hide in God through seeing God's great provisions for our life, We hide in God by trusting in that God's presence is with us. And lastly, I want to speak about how to hide in in God means we trust His promises are for us. David ends this psalm in a peculiar way, I think. And in light of everything that he's talked about in verse 9, he says, Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. He's, he's pointing forward to a time where he's saying, God will not only be my refuge in this life when all hell is breaking loose, but even when I die, I will not be separated from God, that I will not be abandoned. The best is yet to come, that there will be a time where God's pleasures at his right hand will be mine, and I will be standing in the fullness of joy. We can stand secure in this life because we have a promise of being with God in all of eternity, that we can be with God in his presence, that we will be in the fullness of joy. I think there's, there's so much wrong when we look upon preachers and teachers and messages that teach about our best life being now. The promises of God being to experience all the fullness of joy and hope and blessing now. No, if that's our hope, what a sad, sad reality. David is looking forward to a time where nothing can separate him from God. And he's saying that I I will rejoice that living in light of the end, my flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You make known to me the path of life. Tonight, let us fix our eyes on Jesus and rejoice that not even death for the Christian can separate us from the love of God. How might this impact the sufferings that we go through? Enduring COVID, all the things that seem to be discomforts in our life, when we look forward, we can see that these temporary afflictions are preparing for us a weight of glory to be with God on that day. And in that, we rejoice. I know we may sit here tonight and be tired and feel that that promise is distant from us, but that is a real promise for the life of a Christian that we ought to look forward to. Well, this is true and glorious, but there's something else that this passage is pointing us to. And it's interesting that David here is saying that his flesh dwells uh, secure, that he will not be abandoned to Sheol or let the Holy One see corruption. Because the reality of David's life is that he did die and was buried with his fathers. That the truth for him is that uh, that, that he did actually die. And there was a promise to him. In 2 Samuel 7, and let me read this. This was Nathan the prophet, and he said to David, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up after you an offspring who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of my kingdom forever. 
Redemptively, what is happening here is that David is looking through the corridors of redemptive history, looking to a greater king than him, looking to someone who actually would come and defeat death himself, one who wouldn't be abandoned uh, or see corruption in the grave, but actually as Christ lived and as he died, that he took upon death himself, that death would not be the conqueror. David is looking forward as a prophet here, teaching us that Christ would be the ultimate one who would come to bring forth these true pre- uh, pleasures and joy at God's right hand. The writers of the New Testament knew this. In Psalm 2, Peter actually said, I can confidently tell you that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of that day. As, as Peter went on that sermon, people were cut to the heart in recognizing that this king had come and it was Jesus Christ. This psalm so beautifully points to Jesus as our hope and king who conquered death. This means that we have hope in the resurrection too. Because Jesus went before us, that means that we can know that our labors are not in vain and that we one day will have this imperishable seed that we will live forever with him. In Jesus Christ, the promises are yes and amen, and we can hide in Jesus. Our comfort in life and death is is to know that we are hidden in Christ as a great promise for us tonight. Let me conclude with what many of you would know in the Heidelberg Catechism of the great hope and comfort of what it means to hide in God. What is our hope and comfort in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live from him. Let's run from our gods and hide in this beautiful Savior that we have promises that not on our own merit, but that because he has pledged himself to us when we come to him in faith and trust, that we can be hidden in him, enjoying life forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would take these great promises these words of Psalm 16, and that you would implant them upon our hearts tonight, that we would look away from ourselves to see you as the great provider, to know that your presence is with us, and to know in Jesus Christ we have the promises of God. Nothing that we could have earned, but oh, we rejoice in knowing that you have called us to be your people, a feeble, weak, fragile people, that you've called us to be your own, Help us to hide in you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.